hear, O Israel. Thou art to pass over Jordan this day, to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. Get thee up into the land that is over against Jericho, and behold the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel for a possession. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks and water, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass, a land that floweth with milk and honey as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee. For thou art an holy people. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. This God, the Lord God, who gives away whole countries, is the God the English Bible called Jehovah. The land of Canaan that he gave to the Israelites was a tough little bunch of city-states set between Egypt and the Lebanon. But who on earth were these Israelites? There's almost no trace of them in the ancient world. You won't find a museum anywhere that has an Israelite gallery in it. Yet Israel's history, as it's written in the Bible, has become a part of Western history. So it's hardly surprising that generations of Westerners have been tempted to return to this ancient land to look for their beginnings. You know, just behind me is the very mountain where Satan took Jesus and tempted him with all the treasures of the earth. And Jesus said to him, get thee behind me, Satan. Do you believe the Bible? Can you prove it? Well, we live in a scientific age, so people often ask scientists, archaeologists that question instead of priests. As if you could somehow go out and dig up bits of the Bible and prove God. Sort of digging up God, almost. A bit of a lumber, really. And if you believe in the Bible, people just think you're preaching at them straight away. You say, I have found a wall from the time of King Solomon or something. It's a hopeless situation. But in actual fact, it's very important to compare scientific history and the Bible. I tell you why because it helps us understand something of the motives and methods of the ancient people that wrote it. And that's important for us, because their ancient words have such an effect on us still. Look, just down the road from here is the town of Jericho. It's a famous town, you know? The one the trumpets blew and the walls fell down. It's the first town the Israelites conquered when they entered their promised land. They crossed the waters of Jordan. They'd escaped from slavery. They had the Ten Commandments with them. Can you think of more potent symbols for our time and place? So sometimes it can be quite good to succumb to the temptation of trying to fit the Bible and archaeology together to see if they'll match. These great mounds of red earth are the remains of the ancient city of Jericho. It's fascinated archaeologists for over a century now. This rich city at the edge of an oasis by the River Jordan. They've hacked at it, dug trenches through it and argued over it and found wonderful things too. But at the end of the day, the most important thing they've given us is a good idea of how the Bible's word may or may not be trusted. Even if the Bible had never told us that Joshua and his Israelites came through here, Jericho would still be one of the most famous cities on earth. To start with, it's the oldest city on earth, and it was built at the lowest point on earth. This stone tower, nearly 10,000 years old, is the oldest stone building in the world. When it was made, it stood on a plain. All these huge mounds of earth around it archaeological strata represent various cities that were built up through the ages. It's actually an incredible time chart of man's progress on Earth. Somewhere in there, then, might be the dust of ancient Israel, perhaps even the Bible's characters, Joshua, Samson, David, perhaps King Solomon even, and his thousand wives. <laughs> 
The archaeologists that dug out the tower continued their trench right to the outside of the city. And as they cut through the mound, they cut through the city walls, city walls of various ages, like the rings of a tree, getting every, every later as it got to the edge. This is one of their walls here. One of the walls they uncovered. It's rather an unusual one, dates from about 1600 BC. See, it's got a nice, shiny plaster surface on. Now, these sort of walls came into existence just after chariots came into the area. What they were for, of course, was stopping charging chariots, because the chariots would skid on the shiny plaster and run off the wall that was at the top of them. Archaeologists were digging things like this up all over the place, but everybody was giving them different names. To some people, this was called a Hyksos wall, who were the people who attacked it. To other people, God knows, it was probably called a Joshuaite wall or a Kenite wall or an Adamite wall or any sort of a wall, usually biblical names, because the sponsors of the expeditions like that sort of thing. In 1922, the British decided to put it on a scientific foundation. The man in charge of the archaeological mandate of British Palestine, John Garstang, decided to name all of the strata in archaeological excavations after the scientific terms used in European museums. That is, Stone Age, Bronze Age and Iron Age. So that everybody from that moment on had to call their various strata after those three things. Now, the particularly interesting point was the point at which the Bronze Age met the Iron Age, because that was about 1200 BC. And that was the point at which the Israelites were supposed to enter ancient Israel with Joshua and everything. Now, so far, Garstang's been completely scientific. But at this point, he succumbs to the temptation of reading the Bible into archaeology. And instead of looking for that joint between the Iron Age and the Bronze Age, he went looking for Joshua and the invading Israelites. A good morning, brother pilgrim. Pray tell me where you're bound. Tell me where you're traveling to on a disenchanted ground. My name it is Bold Pilgrim, to Canaan I am bound. Traveling through this wilderness on a disenchanted ground. That morning, Josh bit the battle of Jericho. Oh, Jericho, yes, the whole Jericho, Josh bit the battle of Jericho, and, and the wolves come a tumbling down. down. That morning, Josh bit the battle of Jericho. Oh, Jericho, yes, the whole battle of Josh bit the battle of Jericho. And the wolves come a That's where Garstang found Joshua and the Israelites at Jericho. This, he thought, was a late Bronze Age wall. Look, you can see the beautiful big Bronze Age bricks, these lovely brown bricks set in the wall here. And notice how they're all tumbling away at the end. Reminds you of Joshua's seven blasts from seven trumpets at seven circuits of the wall, and the walls came tumbling down, doesn't it? Actually, Garstang was a good archaeologist. He didn't believe in miracles. His suggestion was that there had been an earthquake. There are lots in this area, and the walls had tumbled down in a convenient earthquake. Well, he published his book, and it had a picture of this wall in it and of the city that's behind the wall, and it said, the city of Jericho on Joshua's arrival. And everything seemed fine. The Bible and archaeology had been put together. There was one major snag, however. Years after Garstang worked here, somebody came back, Kathleen Kenyon. She was a very, very good archaeologist and she had much improved techniques. And she proved, without a shadow of a doubt, that this wall was a thousand years older than Garstang had thought it was. So it couldn't have belonged to the time of Joshua and the Israelites. She proved something else that was even more devastating too. She proved that the time that the Iron Age and the Bronze Age met, the time at which everybody was expecting the Israelites to get here, there was nobody living in Jericho at all. The place was completely deserted and had been deserted for hundreds of years. So at that moment, it looked like the Bible and archeology span would never meet. That story of Garstang's walls and Joshua and whether he was or wasn't there, it's been repeated hundreds of times since those days. All over Israel, in fact. People keep coming up with new walls, new evidence of Bible characters, and both the walls and the Bible characters get knocked down again in the following generations. It's an endless, endless argument. But the simple result of it all is the Bible cannot be taken 
as a reliable, obvious guidebook to the ancient world or ancient history in this part of the world. The problem then is not whether or not the Bible is accurate, but how the Bible is accurate. What I mean to say is that the Bible is not an economic or a political history of part of the ancient world. What it is is a history of belief of God revealed to a nation and how they believed in him and didn't believe him. It's a history of sacredness and of faith. Now, the wonderful thing about modern archaeology is it's beginning to dig up that. That's not to say they're actually digging up God or digging up Jehovah, but they're digging up the circumstances in which that particular God first came into existence. In the dark recesses of the Cairo Museum is a great grey granite stela that holds in its inscription the first known mention of ancient Israel, and that in the year 1207 BC. The stela has a victory hymn on it, telling us about a war that Pharaoh Menipatar's army fought in Canaan. The fortress city of Ascalon is taken, it says. The fortress city of Giza is captured, it boasts. The fortress city of Yanoam is disappeared, no less, it announces. And then, and this is the good bit, the people of Israel lie desolate. Their seed is no more. Now, it's especially interesting that Israel is not called a fortress city, but a people. And in the great temple of Karnak in Upper Egypt by the Nile, there's something that bears that out exactly. A few years ago, a friend of mine found a wonderful visual footnote to the Israel Stela, and he found it on this unlikely looking wall. See that stela there? It's a very, very important historical inscription. And the scenes on either side, everybody had always thought, were part of that same story, the same story that this great historical text told. My friend found they were something different. He found they were from the reign of King Menapatar, the king of the Israel stela. You'll see that it's the king attacking fortresses. There's the chariot, there's all the dead people underneath the chariot, and he's attacking a fortress. And even that mess underneath, that's another scene and another fortress. And here, the same king attacking another fortress. Ascalon, it is, one of the towns named on the Israel Stela. And here is a guy chopping the doorway down, somebody lowering their dead child with one of Pharaoh's arrows stuck in it off the battlements, and all the people praying for the king to stop. So we have three towns, just the same as we do on the Israel Stela. Up there, being crushed by Pharaoh's chariots and the Egyptian cavalry, is a Bedouin tribe, which, if my friend is right, is the same Bedouin tribe mentioned on the Israel Stela. In fact, they're the oldest known pictures of the ancient Israelites. This is the ancient city of Megiddo, one of the first Canaanite cities, so the Bible tells us, that was captured by Joshua and the invading Israelites. Perhaps the same Israelites that are on that temple wall at Karnak. But you know, archaeologists working here haven't found a single trace of them. One thing you can be sure of, whether the Israelites were ever here or not, these Canaanite cities had a powerful influence on the people who wrote the Bible. And you can see them right through Israel, right through Syria too. They're usually set on trade routes, often amidst fields of corn, sometimes by the sea. But it's the land behind, filled by peasants, the land all around these tells, that kept the little courts who lived up here in a fair degree of luxury. There's a lovely, lively little drawing of one of these Canaanite courts, and it's cut onto a slip of ivory from the tusk of a Syrian elephant. And it shows the ruler proudly sitting on his recently imported Egyptian throne, all feathers and lovely leopard's legs and things. And in front of him is all his court sitting out one by one. There's a musician plonking away on his lyre. There's the inevitable spear carrier standing there. And behind him, the captain of the chariots, they love chariots, they used to go chariot racing. A lot of their wars were in chariots. Now, it's a lovely little drawing, but it's not great art. Canaanites never really made great art. But there's one way in which they influence us down till today, and that's through their literature and through their religion. And through those two things, they influence the Old Testament and Judaism, Christianity and the Bible. 
center of all ancient cities, of course, stood the gods. And these Canaanite cities were no exception. In fact, they were built around even more ancient, high places. That is, hills that from time immemorial have been regarded as sacred, certain spots on them as holy spots. And this is one of them, the most ancient sanctuary of Megiddo, the high place of Megiddo, the heart of Megiddo, or as the Bible calls it, Armageddon. In other words, this was the theater, perhaps the stalls, from which you could watch the end of the world. Now, there was another one of these Canaanite high places at Jerusalem. And that was the seat of another god, Baal Zephon. And that becomes the Christians' Mount Zion. When the archaeologists were digging here, they found the top of the altar covered in burnt bones. Animals were sacrificed on this altar in great quantity and then burnt. The offering was called Ola. It's where the Bible's word holocaust comes from, a burnt offering. Now, this was put up probably about 3,000 years before Christ. Before long, Megiddo became quite a rich town, and they built this great temple behind the altar for more elaborate rituals for the gods. Consider for a moment what you've got here. You've got a place for burnt offerings. You've got the temple itself. Inside the temple would have been a place for washing, and you have its Holy of Holies. Now, these are exactly the same elements that you find in King Solomon's temple at Jerusalem, thousands of years later. That, too, had its burnt offering. It had its brazen bowl as big as the sea, and it had its Holy of Holies. King Solomon's name, incidentally, contains the name of a Canaanite god, the god Solom, the god of the evening star. Now, it might not look much at the moment, but it was home for a Canaanite god. Actually, in its day, it was a great black building with tiny little slits, and the shafts of light came down here on these two great columns. Certainly not as grand as ancient Egypt, is it? But when these temples were found, they had beautiful little incense altars along the front. And the nice thing about the Canaanites, they weren't great architects, but they did love their music. And on these incense tables, we still survive, you can find tiny little figures of musicians, and they're playing instruments, pipes, banging drums, all sorts of things. Canaanites adored music. This room must have really jumped when they got going for their god. In actual fact, you can still find something of this in the Bible. Look at the Psalms in an old Bible and you'll find these strange words set between the verses, sometimes after the title of the Psalm. They're old musical instructions. We don't know what they mean today. They've been left out of modern Bibles. But there's something to do with the wonderful music that was made in these places. It's all silent now. Actually, there are yet more connections with the Canaanites than that. Think of that great Psalm 137. Think of that verse, If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, May my right hand lose its cunning. Well, that's a very clever Old English adaption of a very difficult Hebrew line that nobody really understood before. It should read, as we now know when we've got Canaanite originals that tell us, may my right hand wither. Not, not quite as poetic, but probably more accurate. Now, I'm not saying that the Old Testament is all Canaanite literature. What I am saying is that traditions of Canaanite literature are very strong in the Old Testament. Just as the Bible says, ancient Canaan was destroyed. Archaeologists have found all these cities burnt and ruined. But they've also found that this wasn't done by the Israelites, but by a lot of other people, a great mass of tribes coming down from the north. And once again, at Thebes in Egypt, you can see pictures of them because after they destroyed Canaan, these same tribes went on to attack Egypt. And in the end, only the Egyptian armies were strong enough to stop them. After their defeat, one of these tribes went back to Canaan and settled down along the coast. The Egyptians had called them the Peliset, the Bible knows them as the Philistines, the mortal enemies of ancient Israel. About a hundred years 
after the Egyptians had repulsed that terrible invasion. A priest set out from Thebes to go to Lebanon, sailing right up the Mediterranean coast to buy some cedar wood for his temple. In the course of his journey, he stopped here, on the coast at Dor. Now, by this time, the Canaanites were no more. This was not the land of Canaan. The coastal area was called Philistia, our Palestine, and the Philistines lived here. Those same people who had attacked Egypt had sort of broken back like a great wave and settled along the plain, built big, strong cities. They found that all this wonderful coastline was made of petrified sandbanks, and they were able to cut into it quite easily and make all sorts of harbours. Some of the oldest slipways in the world are still here. The Philistines had brought a completely new culture and completely new religion to this land. When they moved about, of course, they only had mobile things, things they could carry. Splendid swords, fine helmets, all the sort of paraphernalia of mobile peoples. When they settled down, they started to make all sorts of things. They made especially fine pottery. And this is a splendid example. You can see a lovely seated lady looking at her eyeball to eyeball. You can almost feel the Philistines in her. She's wearing too, or she would have been wearing, a beautiful gold necklace. Philistines were quite good metal workers too. So this is quite an elegant and refined thing. It's a funny thing to think, really. The Philistines weren't Philistine at all. It's just that they'd been given a particularly lousy press. Well, of course, we know who gave them the lousy press, the Israelites in the Old Testament. And where were they at this time? Well, they weren't along the coast. Nobody found anything of them here. In fact, nobody's found hide or hair of them for miles around here, neither along the coast nor on the plain behind. If you take the Bible's word for it, however, you can assume that they were up there in the mountains, because that's where the Bible stories of early Israel are set. David, King David, was once a shepherd boy up in these hills, and when he fought Goliath the Philistine, he took the pebbles for his sling from the bed of a mountain stream. Most of the combats in the early history of Israel take place in just this area, in the zone between the green fields of the Philistines and the uplands of the Israelites. In David's stories, you can see it all very well laid out for you. Chalky mountains with caves where kings and things can hide in, traditional crops, olives, grapes, the Bible here has painted such an accurate description of exactly what was going on in Israel at that time of history. But what can archaeology tell us was happening up in the mountains at the same time? The poor people who'd moved into the mountains were obsessed with storing food. It was a very hard life. They were even obsessed with water too. These pits, in most of the big rooms of these houses, were used to store rainwater. When the archaeologists came to dig them out, they found they weren't just any old pit. To start with, they're absolutely enormous. Whoops, look at this. Oh, it's really big. You could stand up in there, would hold enough water to see you through the summer. And these people weren't half daft either, because archaeologists soon realized that these systems were cut before the houses were made. In other words, the people turned up thought, we're going to live here, God help them. They cut their systems, their elaborate systems, and then they put their little houses on top. They could read too. As the archaeologists were sieving through the dirt, they discovered tiny little fragments of Canaanite texts, so small that you couldn't even read them, but big enough to see that some of the people here at least were literate. And then, marvel upon marvels, in another site, they found a tiny little limestone tablet. Looks really miserable looking thing, actually. It's got scratches all over it. But those scratches turned out to be what is now called Paleo-Hebrew, because later on, it was an alphabet that would develop into Hebrew. Incidentally, that too came from Canaan, the original form of the Hebrew language. So, to sum up, what exactly have you got here? You've got intelligent people living as settlers with an imported technology. Where do they come from, these people? Well, all the hard archaeological evidence suggests that they've been refugees from the old Canaanite cities, 
refugees from the invasions that were coming down the coast. From people, in fact, like the Philistines. So here we are, up in the hills, looking for the biblical Israelites. And what have the archaeologists given us? Little groups of refugees living in small, open settlements. Modern archaeology has begun to reconstruct the lives of these ancient people. And if you do that, you start to come up with an amazing coincidence between scientific theory and the words of the Bible. Look, supposing these people had to fight off a Philistine invasion, or supposing they wanted to go down to the plain and fight for better land, they'd have obviously needed to form themselves into a coalition. So who runs the coalition? Well, they were really too poor to pay taxes to any central authority, I think. The Bible tells us that the people who lived up here weren't too keen on kings. And there's another thing, too. In the ancient world, abstract ideas are very, very few and far between. The word coalition, for example, is one that an ancient person could not have got his mind around. He could have got his mind around the idea king, or he could have got his mind around the idea of God. So let's have a god of coalition. Let's pretend there was a, a big god up here that was the god of coalition, and the priests of that god preached that everybody had to join in this coalition, and the country would therefore be strong, it would have a strong army, there would be prosperity, but if anybody dropped out of the coalition, then there would be disaster, defeat, and all the rest of it. So there would be travelling priests, and they would go around, and the travelling priests would hold the identity of the god, and the religion would all be based upon the idea of oneness, of a joint identity shared, and of identity which was sort of bounced off against the neighbours, that it was different, peculiar only to them, and somehow very strong. Well, of course, that is exactly the situation in the earliest parts of the Old Testament in the history of Israel. The travelling priests are the biblical prophets, and the god of the coalition is Jehovah whose Ark of the Covenant, the rules of the coalition, the 12 tribes carried into battle. You know, here, you can almost dig up God himself. Slowly, the Israelites start to emerge. This is the fortress of Arad on the desert edge of southern Israel. Archaeologists tell us that it was continuously inhabited from about 1000 BC. That's about the time of King David in biblical history. There's a temple here too from about the same time. Texts like this one, written in ancient Hebrew, tell us of an Israelite garrison here a few centuries later. Thousands of years after that huge Canaanite temple at Megiddo, the Israelites of Arad have made their little temple to precisely the same design. Remember that long dark room lit by narrow shafts of light in the two columns where the musicians used to sing and dance? Here's a little version of it here, built by the Israelites. Here, just like at Megiddo, in the middle of the longest side of the temple, the actual altar of the sanctuary. Remember, at Megiddo, the incense tables are gone, but here, in the Israelite temple, two of them were found. And on the top of them, they still had the burnt resin in the middle from the very last time that the great wands of smoke were sent up to God. Behind that, of course, the Holy of Holies, the High Shrine. You remember, in the Bible, the prophets were always getting angry with these high stones that are set up and throwing them over for the glory of God. Well, they wouldn't have thrown these ones over because that over there was where Jehovah himself lived. Even when you come out of the sanctuary, when you come in to the courtyard of the temple, the resemblance to the biblical temple of Jehovah, Solomon's temple, is very strong. This is the same sort of courtyard as the five books of Moses describe Moses building in the deserts of Sinai itself. This is called the outer court. And over here, stood a great water basin, the lava as big as the sea, they say in the Bible, where the priests washed their hands before they went into the Holy of Holies. And over here, perhaps the most remarkable part of all in the temple, this is a sacrificial altar for the Holocaust offerings. 
Remember, the one at the Megiddo was big and round. Now this is built strictly according to the laws of Moses. That means it has to be five cubits long, exactly. One, two, three, four, five. Five cubits, exactly. So here you see you've got an Israelite temple built according to the oldest rules of the land that go back thousands and thousands of years. But now, an Israelite temple dedicated to Jehovah himself. And he was quite a different kind of God. You see, other ancient gods were often gods of parts of things. You had gods of medicine and gods of mathematics, gods of life, gods of death. You could say, the science of understanding the world had consisted of dividing it up into bits and giving each bit a different name and a different god. Now Jehovah was a god of gods, a king of kings, the Bible tells us. He was the god of everything. He was the god of the universal creation. So he was the god of the beginning, the end of life and death, of medicine, physics, geophysics, every area of experience that you could think of. What we call religion then that bit in the church, that bit in the Holy of Holies, is what the ancient people would have just simply thought of in the ineffable mystery at the centre of things. Arad's temple is contrary to Jehovah's law, which says that Israel must have but one temple, and that in Jerusalem. The Bible says that David took Jerusalem for Israel and named it the City of David. It also tells us that David's son Solomon built a temple there, a home for Jehovah to hold the Ark of the Covenant. Yet outside the pages of the Bible, there is no evidence at all that King David or King Solomon ever lived. No record from the early days of Israel has ever been found that mentions either of their names. There is the Bible and there are myths and there's nothing else. Yet today, Archaeologists are excavating the site of the most ancient city of Jerusalem, which they are calling the City of David. Sad to say, it's not only David and Solomon that don't exist, at least they don't exist in scientific history, it's also really all of ancient Israel up until that time. Look, I'm standing in David's own city, the ancient city of Jerusalem. I can't say to you that any of these walls were made by an Israelite, they could have been made by a Bronze Age person. The culture's continuous. Even the pottery these people from the early Iron Age, who we call the Israelites, made, even their pottery is a continuation of previous traditions. There's very, very little here. And yet people so desperately want David and Solomon and glorious Israel. All this memorialization of what is really an Iron Age village is proof of that. Christians and Jews alike desperately want this place to live. All the evidence I've been giving you is really circumstantial. It's saying, look here, this is what the Bible shows you. This is how it could have been. When I first came to Jerusalem, I went to see one of the leading archaeologists here. And he asked me why I'd come. I said I'd come to find the Israelites. And we both burst out laughing because we both knew that, in fact, it was a very, very difficult thing to do. But in the end, I found them. At least I think I did. I didn't find them here in the walls, and I didn't find them in the pottery. I found them in something so obvious that I'd overlooked it. I found it in the elements that went to make up its greatest memorial, in the written word, in the ancient written word of Israel. Until a few years ago, the written Hebrew word from the time of ancient Israel, the time of Chronicles and Kings, was very thin on the ground. There were just a few ancient seals inscribed with the name of the scribe who used it. Just a few spare sentences. There was very little. And then in 1980 in Jerusalem, there was a minor miracle. Somebody actually discovered a Bible text, dug it up. And it was such a text. It was actually written, just as the prophet Jeremiah said, on sheets of silver inscribed with a pen of iron, a tiny little plaque. And here it is. It's actually fragment of the oldest Bible text in the world. When it was found, it wasn't laid out like this. Those little cracks 
that run across it are the results of a very careful unrolling by the conservators. Originally, you see, it had been written on and rolled up very tightly and string passed through it. And it was probably worn on a child's neck. When they started to try and decipher this text, because I don't know if you can see, but it's very difficult to read indeed. The very first word they were able to read was Jehovah. They read it actually three times on this plaque before they could read anything else. That was exciting in itself because it was the oldest occurrence of the name of Jehovah in Jerusalem. That is 6th or 7th century BC, Jehovah had come back to his own city. It's actually a part of the book of Numbers. It's the priestly benediction, the words that Jehovah gave Moses to give to Aaron the priest and his sons, the blessing for the children of Israel. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee, may he make his countenance shine upon thee. You know it. It's the prayer that's recited every day in churches all over the world. It's a prayer, incidentally, that my headmaster used to use at the end of every term to dismiss his boys from his school in deepest Surrey. When I told that story to the Israeli who excavated it, he laughed and said to me, yes, when he was a little boy, his father had come back from the synagogue, put his hand on his head and recited this same benediction. The Bible tells us that the children of Israel were in deep trouble when that silver plaque was made. The nation was stumbling ever deeper into sin, it says. Jehovah's inexorable judgment was falling on those who broke his law. After Solomon's death, the Bible tells us, David's great kingdom had split into two halves. There was a southern kingdom called Judah, with its capital at Jerusalem, and a northern kingdom called Israel with its capital at the hilltop palace of Samaria. Bible history and Israelite archaeology finally joined together here at Samaria. Here, archaeologists found an Iron Age palace. Here, the Bible tells us, King Omri built a palace. And that palace is mentioned in records from outside ancient Israel, contemporary records, where it's called Beit Omri, the House of Omri. So this, you can say, is a genuine Iron Age excavated palace from the reign of King Omri. I suppose it's Omri's son who's the more famous, though, King Ahab, who refused to walk in the ways of the Lord, as the Bible tells us. One thing the Bible doesn't tell us is what a great soldier King Ahab was. In the ninth century, he gathered up a coalition of lots of little kingdoms like this all around Israel, and together they went out and beat the Assyrian army. That tremendous force from North Iraq that used to raid westward practically to the Mediterranean every year. It was King Ahab and his little coalition alone that stopped the Assyrians for a couple of years. Anyway, Ahab and his friends certainly hadn't stopped the Assyrians for good. They kept on coming down into Israel year after year, just like a wolf on the fold, as they say, taking tribute and prisoners, destroying cities. And that, in 701 BC, was the sorry fate of the city of Lachish to the south of Jerusalem. Lachish must have been a hard nut for the Assyrian army to crack. These scenes celebrating the victory were taken from the central room, the very throne room of an Assyrian palace. And here's all the claustrophobia of hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The ramps, the siege engines, like funny tanks, the archers, the sappers, and the poor old Lachishites up their battlements fighting for their lives. In the Bible, the prophets bewail its fall. Here, as the people leave their city for the last time, they pass the elders of their town impaled, stretched out, flayed upon the ground. So here's Lachish's families, with their lady carts, their women and their children, and a few pots and bundles. The eternal refugees with their carts leaving their land. The first time you'll see this scene in history. But it must have been a common enough sight at that time. On the roads that led eastward, from the cities of Israel and Judah to the lands of Assyria and beyond. <laughs> 
These were bad times. About a hundred years after the kingdom of Israel was destroyed by the Assyrians, Assyria itself was destroyed by a group of cities it had earlier conquered, led by that most ancient of all cities, Babylon. Of course, it didn't matter much to the little guys that lived around the edge. They were just dragged off in chains to Babylon rather than being dragged off in chains to Assyria. Well, about 586 BC, Jerusalem itself finally fell. The Old Testament tells us that its king Zedekiah was dragged from the city, his sons were killed, and then he was blinded. Then, of course, he would have been put in chains, along with his courtiers and his priests, the priests of the Temple of Jerusalem, the priests of Jehovah, he would have been brought here and dragged down this great processional way. then were the gates of Babylon, the very gates that swallowed up what was left of poor old ancient Israel. The great whore, the scarlet whore, the prophets call this city in their curses, and they call it that because here it was that Hebrew was almost forgotten as a spoken language, and here it was that some of the Judeans took up worshipping foreign gods. Now it must have seemed to some of the other Judeans in their little ghetto in this huge city that their history the history of ancient Israel had come to a full stop. The Jehovah had created them, that they had lived, and then they had died. Their history then had become a finite thing. And they must have looked back over that history and seen that when they actually kept to the covenant, they did okay, that Jehovah smiled on them. But when they started to break the covenant and fall into sinful ways, their kings died and finally their country was smashed and they were led into exile. And it seemed too that they needed to write this history down, all of it, in the light of this new experience. Because after all, it was a history of divine providence at work on earth. Now, most of these other little princes, when they come here in chains, have been told to bring the city gods, their country gods, with them. Now, the Judeans obviously couldn't have brought Jehovah. He wasn't about to be put in a box and carried anywhere. So they brought the temple treasures in Jerusalem, which the Babylonians put in their treasury, and they must have brought some sacred writings too, because the Bible, the Old Testament, actually mentions all these writings which were around in the time of ancient Israel. There were lists of laws talking about sacred books. There were histories, hymn books, all sorts of wonderful things. This it was that they would use to make their history, the history of this country, their country, which has somehow seemed to stop. They didn't want to write an archaeological history. They didn't want to write a scientific history. This was a sort of a summation of a nation. It was its, its, its last thing. It was its apotheosis. It was a divine history of this grand experiment between a god, a covenant, and a people. It had never happened before on earth. This was its memorial. Because here it was at Babylon that the Old Testament, or the greater part of it, was finally written down. Listen to this. I sit in one of the dives on 52nd Street, uncertain and afraid. Now, listen to this. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. They're both, of course, poems by exiles. The last one, Psalm 137, written by an Israelite by the waters of Babylon. The other one, by W.H. Auden, English poet, September the 1st, 1939, just as the Second World War was breaking out. Now, that poem, as it goes on, the Auden poem, is full of very specific references. And you have to really know that the war is breaking out. And you have to know Auden, the young man in a foreign country, that he's deliberately chosen to leave. There's a whole set of literary references which make the poem really hum. And the more you know about them, the more the poem hums. Psalm 137, we know so little about those Israelites by the side of the waters of Babylon that really the references we have can only be of the most general. 
Now, supposing Auden, Auden's poem had been written a couple of thousand years ago, and historians were trying to, you know, make some sense out of it, put it all together. You can just see the word dive, for example, it caused terrible problems. Archaeologists would go to New York looking for diving boards on 52nd Street, or somebody would publish a street map of New York with a couple of graffiti that might have some special moral reference. That's the sort of condition we're into with the Bible. There is, of course, one basic condition those two poems both share, and that really is a quality of nostalgia. Because the Old Testament, being put together after Israel's history, look, is looking back on ancient Israel, and it sees, it sees the land through somebody's mind's eye, through somebody's sad mind's eye. So you get visions of every tree and every stone of Israel. As the scribes go for walks across its country and its pages. And every land purchase of Israel is delicately recorded. Every time, say, Abraham buys his burial ground from a Hittite, or Jehovah grants the land to the patriarchs, very carefully recorded. Huge genealogies to make sure that that careful recording comes right up to date. So if the exile should return home, they would know exactly where their land was, the land they bought, the land they remembered. So, this exile has a most profound effect upon the Old Testament and its writing. They're looking back to see what went wrong with their contract with Jehovah. So they're remaking their own history. You get a slow slide, it's a tragedy, from the high days when, when there's high morality and the slow slipping away from the covenant. And if you add that, if you add that quality to the tremendous cultural contraction that must have happened in Babylon, the Jews fighting for their identity in this vast old city with lots of other little people all around them, then you get perhaps the basic ingredients of the Old Testament as you see it now. You get nostalgia, you get this absolutely rigid adherence to the idea of the race, the Israelite race, and you get also this tight examination of history and how Jehovah worked with it and how, how they have somehow fallen from grace. And that is why that early part of the Old Testament gives you this amazing romantic evening glow of history with heroes like Samson, with David and wise men like Solomon, all these fabulous people living in a fabulous long ago land. Jehovah.